Hi everyone, I'd say it's time for another simple shader. I don't think we've created an infinite zoom here yet, especially if it's a cool looking effect that we might be able to use in a game. And if not, it's still fun to watch. So let's get to it. I won't waste time with a long introduction and will jump straight into the work. So let's create a new scene, add a color rack to it and assign it a new shader material. Just the usual process. So right clicking on the scene folder and create new scene, uh, user interface, let's call it for example endless. Okay, and right clicking the root node, add child node color rect. I'll give it the usual black color and the usual dimensions, layout, transform size, full HD 1920 by 1080. Okay, scrolling down to the material section and the new shader material, click and new shader, which is called endless.gd shader. It's a type shader and mode canvas item. Let's just change the folder to shaders. Okay, create and clicking again to open it in the shader editor. Very well, let's expand this section a little bit. And Godot generated the basic shader code from which we can delete everything unnecessary, leaving only the fragment function. So I'm deleting the vertex function and I'm deleting light. Very well. All right, let's start with the uniform parameters. This time we'll have a few more of them since I try to include as many options as possible for customizing the final effect. So I'll start with the basic parameters and add the others as we go through the code. Among the basics, there are the resolution for recalculating the aspect ratio, the base color of the effect and the animation speed. So let's add them. Okay, uniform. Uh, sorry, <laughs> back to resolution and the default value is our full HD dimensions 1920 by 1080. Okay, that's the first one. Now the color uh, uniform VEC3 color in the RGB space. Let's give it the hint source color so we get that nice color picker in the inspector and let's start at this point 0.2, point 0.3, point 0.6. So it should be a shade of blue, I suppose. Let's take a look at the inspector. Yeah, something like a dark blue. Okay, and the third one, uh, uniform uh, float speed with a hint range and the initial value one. And let's make it from zero so we can put the effect to a full stop and for example to 10 with the step point 0.01. Okay, and I'll insert the corresponding code in the fragment function, the usual stuff first. Let's move the uh, origin of coordinates to the center. So we subtract point 0.5 from the UV coordinates and uh, recalculate the aspect ratio. So UV X would be multiplied by resolution x divided by resolution y very well and finally the time variable float time is the internal time times speed okay so our effect will be characterized <clears throat> by two basic properties it will be centered around the origin and it will change depending on the distance from that center so let's write a basic formula and display the result so as i said the effect will change with the distance from the origin so we'll need to know that distance for this converting the uv vector into polar coordinates using the well-known formula works perfectly let's do it right here so float radius is as we know length of the uv vector and now we need the theta angle float theta is a ton of UV X and UV Y. 
If you're not sure about these uh, calculations, please uh, check out my video uh, dedicated to the polar coordinates and everything is explained there in details. Okay, and now to show something. Uh, vector 3 result is, let's make it simple, color divided by the radius. And finally, let's assign it to the internal variable color, which is a vector 4, so it would be our result, and 1 for the, <laughs> one for the alpha channel. Okay, wait for it. Very well, it seems to be too bright, so let's reduce the effect by the factor of 10, which should then be easier, for, uh, easier on the eyes. So where is it here? Multiply the radius times 0.1. Okay, that's better. We can continue. As we saw at the beginning of the video, the effect should, should change not only with the distance, but also with the angle from the x-axis, which is precisely this theta value. So let's add another variable called shift, which for now will be equal the sine of the angle. Let's do it here, uh, float. Shift is sine of theta. Okay, we'll use this result as the argument of another sine function, which will give us what we call shape. Float shape is sine of shift. Okay, and we'll use this shape in the line that calculates the color in this one with the result. So I'll simply multiply color by the shape. Okay, very well. Uh, so far, we haven't achieved anything particularly impressive, but in a moment, we'll see how using these two functions and some additional helper parameters, we can create a result that will form the basis of the final effect. For now, let's see what happens when we multiply the theta value by 2. So let's find this shift and instead of theta it would be 2 times theta. Okay, it looks like we have two light sources shining in opposite directions. If we change the value to 3, we'll have 3 lights and so on. So uh, where is it? Here, 3, we have 3, 4, Okay, I think you got the idea. We can also try seeing how the time parameter affects the final effect, giving us the basic animation. So let's add time. Time plus this. All right, and it's rotating. To, uh, uh, yeah, for now, let's remove the time parameter and continue shaping the basic effect. Let's get rid of that. Okay, so to achieve a gradual decrease in brightness toward the edges, we'll need a function whose graph approaches zero, but never actually reaches it. We can demonstrate in the Desmos app how an exponential function meets this requirement precisely. Okay, here it is opened at the URL desmos.com and I'll write x x. Okay, and since we'll be working with a distance that is positive on this part of the x-axis, it would be more convenient if the graph were inverted. And we can easily achieve that like this. Instead of x, let's use negative x. Perfect. Now we can see that for 0 it's 1 and then it's gradually decreasing to 0 but never reaches that. That's exactly what we need. So let's get back to Godot and add a new variable based on this function. So before just calculating the shift, I'll add float this for distance. And as I said, x of negative radius. Very well. And we'll add this variable into the following line. So to the shift and shape definitions. So it would be five times the sine of five times theta plus this and as for the shape shift uh can make it this plus shift all right something has changed but it's still not quite right the this value is too small so it doesn't have much effect let's try and multiply it by say 30 
Okay, let's make it here. 30 times exp. Okay, that's much better. And what if, just for fun, we try adding time here? Time plus. Wait for it. Okay, and the foundation of the effect we want to create is starting to take shape. I said we add time just for fun, but in reality, we'll need it exactly this way. For now, though, we'll set the speed parameter in the inspector to zero, so these animations don't distract us. Okay, I think it's time to turn these constants, the 30 and 5, into uniform parameters. I've named them warp and frequency. So let's add them uniform float warp with a hint range and the initial value would be 30 and it goes from 1 to, for instance, 100 and 0.1 for the step is okay here. And the second one, a uniform float frequency with another hint range. And let's put it to 10. So we have more, uh, more parts of the final ornament. And again, it would be from 1 to 100. And uh, this time we want just one for the step because otherwise we would have some uh, artifacts caused by the polar coordinates. All right, and let's use them in the code. So I have this, so instead of 30, we will use warp. And instead of five, let's use frequency. Frequency. Okay, let's start a time again. And we can uh, we can try what happens if we change these parameters. So let's increase warp. Yeah, something is definitely going on here. Or decrease. And the frequency. Okay, I think something is wrong here. It shouldn't be 10. It should be 100. I said again. Yeah, now it's definitely more frequent. Or if we change it to 1, we got something like a spiral. All right, let's get back. Very well, there are a few additional refinements to make. The first one will be higher brightness, which we'll define as another parameter. And let's call it emission. Uniform float emission with a hint range. And it starts at 10, for instance. It would go from 0.1 to 20 and the step 0.01. And let's add it to the code. So here in the result, uh, color times shape divided by radius multiplied by emission. Eh, sorry, emission. Wait for it. Okay, much better. It's starting to look even more interesting. Now we'll add parameters to control the brightness of the inner and outer layers of the effect. Uh, sorry. <laughs> This wanted to scroll the code. A uniform float inner with a hint range and the value 0.6, for instance, and it goes from 0 to 1 and 0 0.01 as the step. And now outer uniform float outer, another hint range I said, and for instance 0.4 and step point zero one. And let's use them in the shape calculation, which is right here. So it would be uh, here, inner plus outer times the sign. Okay. So the effect now looks a bit overexposed, which we'll fix with the last parameter called contrast. Uh, uniform float contrast and a hint range and it starts at for example 2 and goes from 1 to 10 uh, with the step uh, yeah sure 0 0.01 problem okay and uh, as we know from previous tutorials we often use the power power function to enhance color transitions. So it's not a true contrast, but 
since I've already named it, that will leave it with this name. If you want, you can rename this parameter later. And now we'll use it in the result line. So the power function, as I said, and it goes to the power of the contrast. And since we are working with a, with a vector three, we need to use a vector three for the parameter for the argument as well. Contrast, that should be it. Great. Well, we are done. Now we can play around with the parameters. So for instance, if I change the color to something greenish, it looks pretty nice. And let's make it faster. It's a faster speed. All right. Or fully stopped. This is pretty nice as well. OK, and we already work with the warp, so just, just for uh, reminding us what happens if we uh, increase it or decrease it and the frequency yeah okay and now the emission let's make it like a rising star for example or some very serial uh, explosion now the inner value the outer one and contrast which gives us more a uh, stylized look and feel i would say yeah, there are many, many possibilities to work with. Let's get back to the original settings. OK, we are done. Thank you very much for watching. We could continue improving the effect, for example, by modulating the individual RGB channels to achieve a more colorful effect. Or we could replace some functions with others and experiment with more complex shapes. But I'll leave that up to each of you. The important thing is that we've shown how to create an infinite effect using a combination of an exponential function and the periodicity of the sine function, which can be quite useful. For now, take care, good luck with your projects, and I'll see you in the next video.